Are you looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons, Bible teacher and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. Doesn't mean I don't sin any longer, but positionally, I am brand new in Him. So once I'm believing in Him, I am sealed totally. Now, I keep on believing because Colossians says, through Paul, says that as I received Him by faith, so I walk in Him. That's why when you read through Scripture, it's going to talk about continuing in your faith, keep on believing, etc., etc. Not so you'd lose your salvation, but because from the beginning to the end, it's impossible to please God without faith. Now, last week, we taught on the whole issue of fear. I didn't have time to unpack this, but part of fear is this. When our fear rises, it's because our trust is diminished. The more faith we have, the less we have fear. The more fear we have, the less we have faith. So if I want to deal with my fear factor, I have to deal with my trust factor. Now, how do I get more trust? Well, it's simple. The more times I spend in God's word and believing it to be God's mind on paper and sufficient, then my trust factor rises because while I'm in the word, I have to believe the word. I am now believing that Christ is the Christ of the word and now I'm focusing upon him and my faith factor rises and now I believe, hey, he is God. He is sovereign. Nothing will happen to me apart what either permits or prescribes. And it's all for his glory and hopefully for my character development. But none of that is to get me into heaven or to keep me saved. That's something that I do afterwards. Now, some of you might say, what happens if I have a bad hair day and I begin to doubt God? The Lord is very clear on that. While he does want our faith to increase, while he does want us to continue in faith as a believer in Christ, not to stay saved, he does say in First Timothy, he says, if we believe not, in other words, as a Christian, I've spoken to believers now, when we have that bad hair day, when we believe not, he says he abides faithful because he cannot deny himself. And so what happens at that moment is he says, I know that's the case, but I'm going to keep my promise to you that once you've trusted in me, you have eternal life. Now, this is stuff I'm not going to have time to open up next week, but I wanted you to see that faith to get saved is a one time I'm trusting you, but then it's a continual walk of faith there afterwards. So I trust in him by placing my faith, but then we go a little bit further than that, which brings me now to point number two. Belief is not how much we trust, but it's in whom we trust. It's not how much we trust, it's in whom we trust. So let's go back to some of you that are on the front end of coming into Christ for your salvation. Some of you might think, I have to know everything there is about the Bible, and I have to believe it's all true, and I have to have all my questions answered from creation, all these other issues, and you're struggling with this, and so you're way out over here saying, I could never trust Christ because I really don't know if I blah, 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 blah. I, have, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't understand all of this stuff. Well, that's why Jesus comes back, and he says, how much faith do you really need to have in order to get to heaven? He uses two illustrations about the amount of faith we have. The first illustration, he says, is the faith of a grain of mustard seed. Now, I know there are a lot of plants that have real tiny seeds in them, and a mustard seed is very, very small. The idea is compare the mustard seed to maybe the seed of, a, of an avocado or something. The point still being is, it's not how much faith you have, it's the faith that you do have, it has to be, here it is, in the right object, Jesus Christ. Second, he uses the illustration of a faith of a little child. A little child has... Faith, sometimes it's a blind faith where they just kind of trust you by jumping into your arms. But if you have children, you know that some of them, it doesn't take much and they think the boogeyman is outside their window and they're getting scared because they hear noises and they're very fearful. And so he says, it doesn't mean that you have to have a well-advanced system of faith and confidence and trust. Just a faith of a little child. The faith of a grain of mustard seed. It's not how much faith you have, but it must be in the right object in order for you to have that faith. Now, I hope you're staying with me because I am going to answer the question, the work of faith. Now, with that in mind, you'll notice up here on the platform, I have, um, I have a chair up here. Many of you have seen me do this chair illustration. I'm going to do it again for you. I'm not a magician. It won't be, you know, I won't make it disappear or anything like that. But I wanted you to, I want to answer another question because I'm moving in the direction of what is known as passive faith, active faith, and the work of faith. So with that in mind, let's look at this chair. All right. I'm so far away from, from the world, I don't even know what that is over here, but my end object should be I would want to sit on that chair 
because that chair would be great comfort. So all of a sudden, you come to me and you say, hey, Stan, for you to be comfortable, you need to sit down and you need to have an object to sit on. Oh, really? You mean if I sat down, I'd feel better? Yes, you would. And then you say, look over here, Stan. This is a chair. And if you sat in this chair, it will make you very comfortable. So we have what is known as saving faith. There's three parts of it. The first part of it is I have to hear. I have to know. So in other words, people who they cannot trust in Christ until they know Christ and not know him for salvation, but know that I'm lost and Christ is the Savior. They have to know facts, we're going to say. But even knowing facts is not enough to get them saved. Now you can tell me, all right, that's a chair. Oh, I see that's a chair. And now you convince me that it'll hold up people. Other people have sat in that chair. They were relaxed in the chair. They sat properly in the chair. I can see that. So not only do I know that to be a chair, I believe that it is truth as a chair. So I hear it's a chair. I believe it's truth that it's a chair. But that still isn't enough to carry me over. Now, this is where we get into the obedience of faith. If you want to know some verses that will help you on this, when you get to such passages as Acts chapter 6, verse 7, Romans chapter 1, verse 5, Romans chapter 16, verse 26, you're going to see the phrase obedience of faith, obedience of faith. This is where there are people that sometimes will go off in these tangents that will say, well, obedience of faith means, yes, you trust Christ, but you also must do good works. You have to do all of this stuff. And they now bundle up this obedience of faith into its faith, but it's obedience too. Some of them go as far as, no, you get saved by faith, but you then need to stay saved by your obedience. And I do not believe that's what it's saying in clear theology, because that would contradict so many verses of which you'll get in a few moments here that says it's not of good works that get you to heaven. So what could it mean? Now you're moving from what is known as passive faith to active faith. Passive faith is, I can say in my mind, this chair will hold me up. I can have faith in that chair that will hold me up. But it's not holding me up until I put active faith in this thing, until I obey what you're telling me by placing my actual faith in that chair. Now let's pause for a moment. In case some of you are saying, okay, a grain of mustard seed and a, and, and a little child, but I have no faith. Well, I don't know that that's true. And the reason I believe that is because you had enough faith to get in your car, drive down a highway, believing that your brakes would hold you. I know you have enough faith because even in my chair illustration, all of you are seated on chairs that you know would hold you up and you just plucked yourself in those things. So you have the faith. It goes back to, will you activate that faith and you put it into not a system of works. You take that faith, you activate it by placing it in Jesus Christ. Now watch up here. I come up here now. Am I trusting this chair to hold me up? I am. It's my active faith. I knew it would in my head, but now I'm putting my full confidence some people would put the word, I'm committing myself. That's not a bad word, except theologically, in Scripture, whenever it talks about committing, you're either committing your life to Christ as a dedicated person, or you're committing a sin. The word that's most used in Scripture is that you are placing your trust, your faith, your dependence on. So there is that active choice. So now I am doing that. Now, if that chair was Christ, and I am outside of Christ, God loves me and he wants me to go to heaven. So he paid the price for that chair, in a sense. The, paid the price for me to be able to get into that chair. He now loved me enough to communicate to me that the only way to get into heaven, in a sense, is to trust the chair. He also brought the message to me and he convinced me that it was true. But even then, that doesn't mean I have my active faith. So now he's telling me, believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved. Those are, in a sense, commands given to us. Now my obedience of faith, my active faith, my work to that faith is saying, okay, Lord, I obey you now. You're telling me for, for me to go to heaven and my sins forgiven, I've got to place my faith in Jesus Christ. So now I put my full faith in Christ. That whole active part is the obedience of faith. So he's saying, yes, you want to do the work? The work is to believe in Jesus Christ. So you have to activate that by placing your faith alone in him. Now that being said, let me go through a chain reference here. I'm not going to have time to preach through all these verses, but I'm going to read them to you, and you can jot down the addresses because you might not be able to flip through it fast enough. But I want you to have these down. Why do I want you to have it down? Because your faith must rest upon salvation by faith alone in Christ. Let me make one more statement, and then I'll go through these. What I'm about to give you are not verses that say to go to heaven, you've got to believe in Christ. There's plenty of those. I don't have time to go through those today. In fact, the book of John has the word believe, a hundred times, and the whole reason the book was written is that you would believe in Christ. But the verses I'm giving to you have a little bit more of a meaning. 
The verses I'm going to give to you now are those verses that will specifically say going to heaven is not of works. So I wanted you to have that. So if you want to write them down, put them in your Bible so when you're talking to someone, you'll know where to start. You're going to start at Acts, Acts 13, 38, and 39. That's where you're going to start. And then from then on, you can just write your change. So let me go through this quickly for you, Acts 13, 38, and 39, so you can see that it's not by works that we do. It goes like this, starting in verse 38. Therefore, let it be known unto you, brethren, that through him, Christ, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you, and through him, everyone who is be, who believes is freed from all things from which you could not be freed through the law of Moses. So keeping the law, knowing the law, keeping the law of Moses will not get you saved, so even the religious things of the law will not save you. So good works won't get you to, won't get you to heaven. All right, another one is Romans 4, 5. This one is very popular. You probably have this memorized. It goes like this. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. So it's not good works that we do that gets us to heaven. The work of faith, yes, but not good deeds. And that's the whole idea there in Romans chapter 4. The next is Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Galatians 2, verse 16. And it says this, Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified or declared righteous by the works of the law, that would be a religious doing of good works, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we believed in Christ so that we may be justified by faith in Christ, here it is, and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. That verse alone could stand, and that's all you would need to know. It's not by any works that you do. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, if you will, flip there. Verse 8 says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, we talked about that, and not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that you can't boast about it. That's cool, because those that do believe it's by works, they then automatically would have something to brag about. Somehow I got here, I did something right, as little as it might have been, so that's why I'm here. So there's a little bit of a brag thing. When you say it's not of works, that means you are totally abandoning yourself only to Christ. That You're so hopelessly, helplessly lost. He's the only one by his grace and mercy can reach down and save you. There's nothing you can brag about yourself. So Galatians 2.16, Ephesians 2.8.9. Yeah, there is a reason to be good. You'll read that in the next verse. It says we've been ordained to do good works, not to get saved, but because we are. Philippians 3.9 says this, and may be found in Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. In other words, I'm not righteous because of good works I've done from the law. I'm found in him. But that which is through the faith in Christ, the righteousness of which comes by God through faith. So again, it's not of works. It's by faith alone in Christ. Titus chapter 3, verse 5 is one of my favorite ones. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. No deeds, righteous deeds. But it's according to his mercy by the washing of generation and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, not by any good deed that we do. If you will, turn to Galatians 1, 8, and 9. While you're turning there, I'm going to go back up here to my chair illustration. Some of you might come to the conclusion, okay, going to heaven, it's not by works. I got that. If I'm going to do the work, the only work that I do is I place my faith in Christ. But now maybe I need to do faith in Christ and works at the same time. So now it's not, yeah, it's not only works. Now it's going to be faith and works. Now, if you will, look up here. If I was to um, sit on this chair, this chair representing Christ for a moment, I have one cheek on the chair, the other cheek off the chair. So am I trusting the chair or am I trusting myself? I'm kind of trusting both. Because if one of you decided to get frisky and come over here and kick this chair out from under me, that's okay, no big deal. I still got me over here to hold myself up. So it's kind of a little bit of both. And there are people that believe that. And that doesn't work either. Look at Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. It's interesting because we did a, a little Bible devotion with the pastoral staff at our planning retreat. And I went through all the churches in the New Testament. And I talked about all the different, or most of the sins of each of the New Testament churches to let everybody know that we have trouble in all the churches. And the trouble isn't, do we have a typo on our PowerPoint? Do we have a, a problem because um, uh, someone didn't park their car right? We, we, had, we had trouble in our church because something didn't go right in our facilities. No, the real sins in churches are the things of the heart that are wrong. And so we went through all the issues that might be in the New Testament churches. But watch this. Then I went through every church that of the same churches that had something good to say about them because in every church you do got sin, but in every church they're also blessed. They affirm them. The only church that didn't have that was the church of Galatia, uh, of Galatia or the churches of Galatia. In fact, he called them foolish. And here's what he had to say in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9. <clears throat> But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, salvation by faith in Christ, the death and resurrection, contrary to what we have preached to you, that means another gospel, 
let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man is preaching now, not in the past, but currently, to you a gospel contrary to what you receive, which is faith alone, Christ alone, death and resurrection of Christ, he is to be accursed or damned. And as one writer said, God damned. Now remember, he didn't want to do that, but we put ourselves underneath the condemnation and the curse of God when we do that. Because what are they doing? They're preaching another gospel, the gospel of grace. And you cannot add to it. There's passages of scripture that says that it's either going to be of grace or it's going to be of works. If it's of grace, it can't be of works. If it's of works, it can't be of grace because you can't have grace and works together. So the only conclusion is it's got to be by grace alone, which was our song today. So number three is belief is not a balance between my work and God's work. It is totally his grace. It is totally his mercy. It is totally on Jesus Christ. Well, folks, um, I got a... I need to say this and then I'm going to close, I promise. I'm, I'm going to ask you to um, give me a moment to share something that's on my heart with, with you all here and with those that are listening on the radio and on, on the um, internet. <clears throat> I've been a pastor a long time and I pastored a lot of churches and I deal with a lot of people. I have the joy of the thrill of victory of watching people come into our church and want to join our church the excitement that people have, and, and those things really light the wonderful fires of our pastors and those in Christian leadership. Some of the things that sometimes, you, 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 you know, we're always on the front line hoping to make everyone feel welcome. And we start talking to people and they, they tell us, you know, what are you looking for in church? How can we help you? Blah, blah, blah. And they, it boils down to we want great music, uh, whatever that is to them. They want to have a, a nursery. It has to be a certain way, whatever that is. A youth department, whatever that is. And so they go through all of this stuff. And they, 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 I never hear them say, or rarely hear them say, I'm looking for a church that preaches a message that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. I rarely ever hear that. Very few. I mean, on one hand do I hear that they're looking for that. Then you have people in church that come and go, and then now they're a part of church, and now they begin to think, well, I don't like this and I don't like that. So they then begin to look for other churches. And part of it is even convenience. You know, which is one that's closest to my house? Oh, they're not going to go to some wild cult and they're not going to go to some Roman church. I understand that. But they begin to now look for convenience, music. What do they have for the kids? What do they have for this? Whatever. But they don't ever really ask, do they believe that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And should they ever ask that question, they probably will get an answer like, yeah, we, we, we kind of believe that. All right, that's good. Most fundamental churches of some type, conservative, will believe that. But they don't go to the next level. Do they preach that message? Watch this. Consistently. Now, some of you, when you hear the word consistently, you think, well, that means every Sunday. Well, yeah, in a way I do. In fact, I would say anytime you suspect anybody is not saved, you need to give that message. But that's not really where I'm going. Consistently is this, that they not only preach the message, salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, for the glory of God alone, that, that idea. They do it consistently where that next week you don't hear a message. Yes, salvation is by faith in Christ. But if you don't turn here or make him that or change this or do this, you might not be saved. And if you really are saved, your whole life is going to change. So look at your life to really determine if you're saved. So now all of a sudden we've become fruit inspectors and the list goes on and on and on. And now we either front load the gospel or we, we, we put the, um, the works in the trunk of the gospel, but it isn't only the gospel. And so what I would like to remind us here, that when God is looking for us, yes, we want to have healthy churches where there's no drama. And I don't mean active drama. You know what I mean by drama. We want to have healthy churches that are growing and trying to strive for a level of spiritual maturity and excellence in music and kids and quality of facilities. We want all of that. But the bottom line is, is it solid in its doctrine? Does it teach the doctrine across the board? Do, do they do it consistently? And do they do it the same way, same message? And so if I could, in your own heart, I love you. If you choose a church, remember those are the foundational truths that the rest of the stuff can more accurately build on. But if you don't have that, and a lot of times they're chasing this, chasing that one seminar after the next seminar to find out what works, compare churches, what are they doing, how can we make it work? That's not entirely wrong, but I'm going to tell you what we're doing then is we got the cart before the horse. And so you that are military people, I know God's going to move you on. Some of you that are... in. Uh, High school kids, you're going to go off to college. 
when you do, yes, you want to look for a vibrant youth ministry. But don't sacrifice the clarity of the gospel and the correctness of it on the altar of this kind of stuff. I just urge you because this is the message that Jesus Christ, watch, is. It's the message he preached. It's the message that he then inspired Paul and the other writers to write for us to believe, to preach, to teach, to defend even until death. So he's raised the relevance of it all the way to the top. Folks, I love you and I have nobody in mind, but I have all of you in mind. Let's pray, shall we? With every head bowed and every eye closed. In a few moments, we're going to pray. Some of you might be wrestling now. What do I need to do? You need to place your faith in Christ. In only in Christ. In only your faith in Christ. That's the work of faith. And frankly, sometimes it could be a little easier thinking I can keep a system of rules than it is for you to totally abandon yourself to Christ alone. It could be harder to believe in Christ alone and they call it easy believism. No, it could be the most difficult thing to do to give it all up where you're only trusting Christ. So it's not easy believism. It's not just believing a set of facts and moving on. It's fully trusting in Christ and the sufficiency of what Christ did for us on the cross. Are you there? Will you get there? And more importantly, will you get there before you die? Because if not, you'll never get there. And I say that out of love, not as a desire. I want you to be there with Christ. Are you ready now to, in a sense, give up what you thought would get you to heaven? Change your mind about all of that and now place your faith in Christ. What's the work of God? To believe on Him, Christ, whom He, God, has sent. Would you do that? I don't even have to give you a prayer because a prayer won't save you either, but it is that transaction thing going on where it's now transferring your faith from the wrong object to the only object, Jesus Christ. And only Christ. I'd like to pray for you. Now, me praying for you won't get you to heaven. I don't have any magical place with God to bring you in, but I want to kind of welcome you that you are in when you trusted Christ. And so as a welcoming prayer, that's my prayer for you, but I'd like to know if I can welcome you because you trusted Christ and you're now part of his forever family. Is there anyone in here today that without coming forward, without standing up, without saying anything, but would only slip up your hand and put it down quickly, that would let me know that you're trusting Christ in here today and you finally understood what it really means to have faith alone in Christ? Would you put up your hand right now? Is there anyone at all? All right. I suspect... You've heard this so many times that our church is filled full of people who know this. But please don't um, get cold to this truth. Let it energize you. Let it motivate you. Let it drive you. Let it also guide you as you make decisions on your walk with God and your place of worship on a Sunday morning for God. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this great truth that it's all wrapped up in the bow of mercy and grace. And I thank you that, Father, that you tighten that bow with forgiveness and by what you've done for us on the cross and your heart of love, you handed it to us. And now this package is here. And, Father, we have only one thing to do, and that is to receive that package by placing our faith alone in you, that active faith. We transfer it willingly with right thinking to you as the one who died. So we're activating our mind right now, that work of faith, that obedience of faith. We're placing our faith in you. We're doing the only work that we can do to have eternal life by placing our faith in you. But Father, I pray that we who know this, we will never get cultists and we'll never get tired of hearing it preached and taught. And Father, help us to know it so well that we can do that. We can share it and teach it and defend it. And then Father, we own it so much that we're willing to die for that truth. Help us to realize that all the other truths about walking with you and our Christian life experience is built upon the truth of that and our faith in you because that's what gives us you as our Savior, but you, Holy Spirit, you as our power source. And so, Lord, I pray that this will be something this church will never move away from. Our Father, I just love you. 
I worship you and I adore you. In Jesus' name, amen. You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries and president of Florida Bible College in beautiful Orlando, Florida. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us make it clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear.